Today's episode is brought to you by West Ham Insurance Group, one of the oldest independent insurance agencies in the state of Tennessee. It started in 1895 right here in O'Brien County, Tennessee. Find the agent closest to you by calling one 800 467 5453 or by visiting www.westhaninsurance.com. Thank you, Emily. Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home in West Tennessee. I'm your host, Scott Williams. Okay, Emily, as usual, before I introduce today's guest, can you tell me something you have discovered at Discovery Park of America? So, Real Foot Lake is very shallow and dotted with stumps, logs, and cypress knees, so they developed a boat that is able to go along the lake, and those are called stump jumpers. Very good. I was there uh, last night with some friends for dinner at Blue Bank Resort on Real Foot Lake, and it was dark, but then it was thundering like crazy. Uh, and as it would thunder, we would take pictures of the lightning. So it was really a uh, fun night last night. I actually saw you here at Discovery Park with your friends. Uh, we had done the lights before. Did you enjoy the light? Your friends, did they enjoy the, the Christmas lights? They did. One of my friends, he's from Kenya, and so he wanted to see the lights before he went back to Kenya for Christmas. So I got to show him around, and they really enjoyed it. Oh, that's excellent. Yeah, you were behind me. Mm-hmm. You, you were yeah. in a bigger hurry than I was, and I was like, Who's that person on my tail? Um, Apparently so. Because <laughs> I was really soaking it in. Uh, you were yeah, probably thinking I was, I was just, a very old driver up there going very slow. So I was just cruising along. <laughs> Okay, so today's guest is really special. I'm really excited to talk with him. We have Gary Foreman, who is the owner of Native Sun Productions, among a lot of other things. Welcome, Gary. Hey, thank you. I loved uh, being with all of you right now. It's really great. Thank you. So uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your childhood, where you came from, and uh, what was your path to where you are today? Well, you know, uh, this path is going to sound like many others who are in the subject matter that we're going to cover today, but... Um, I was uh, raised in the Midwest, uh, born in Indiana, and then eventually, uh, uh, by my third year, we had moved to Wisconsin, and that's really where I grew up. But um, right about uh, mm, two and a half years after I arrived in Wisconsin, something phenomenal came into my life, and that was the Walt Disney series on Davy Crockett, and... uh, and that changed my life uh, in many ways. And in fact, as you look at the age group, you know, the baby boomers, um, that series really impacted uh, millions of lives who, you know, uh, directed their careers to education or something related to their fascination, new fascination with American history. So I was not unlike many of those people. The little bit different is that I never quite got over the Crockett addiction and, uh, been with me all my life, and um, uh, it's really benefited me in many ways. I've met some phenomenal people, of course, as you do too, when you're covering these journeys. And so, um, by the time I uh, uh, I was in my early part of my life, I was trying to figure out how I'm going to take all my passions and uh, my and my media training. And I had already started working for an ABC affiliate by the time I was 22. Well, and so you were, what aspects of production were you working in? Well, mostly news. Um, I started off as a photographer. I am still a professional photographer in, in both cinematic and well, still photography. But um, I was also became a producer. And at in, in that early stage of my life, I was doing everything as you do in a medium to small market. And um, so I started becoming a, a writer and producer as well. And I really enjoyed that. But I, what I wanted to do is not so much do the, the filtered news. Even back then, I, I started saying that I wanted to tell America's stories. And that was before there was a history channel. As it turned out, um, by my mid-40s, I was able to be part of the, um, the production group that started the History Channel programming in 1994 with the American Revolution series, where I was both a producer and series consultant on on the three or the six episodes so then that's what started the history channel so your uh you obviously went down two tracks simultaneously a passion and love for history but also you know interest and passion in in uh television production um which one which one was the primary focus for you 
Oh boy, that's always and see that's is where you make lists and you and you you try to update your list. Where am I now on this list? <laughs> and I kind of went one back and forth because it was really um, a, a, a twist. I wanted to be both a historian storyteller. I also wanted to be a producer. I also want to take photographs, so I want to do it all. And so eventually I was able to master that or somewhat master that by creating my own stories on different networks, including History Channel. I've done about 50 some stories on, on the History Channel um, and other networks, including uh, Discovery, PBS, uh, a &E. So that was my primary um, group of clients that I did all my damage. <laughs> you're 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 living the dream of so many people that I talk to people who, you know, half the people you talk to in college who are majoring in uh, radio, television production or whatever want to end up being you. Uh, wh wh what was the secret to your actually getting to do what so many people want to do? Um, well, I remember was, that's a very good question. And, and to answer it, I'm going to go back to how stunned I was. I, I was actually um, majoring in a different area i was majoring in landscape architecture and i decided photography pulled me towards media and my parents almost killed me because i was already doing so well in landscape architecture but the the thing was i remember my first major class i was sitting uh in a large uh, lecture room with about 600 kids i call them kids students at the university and i said oh my god look at the competition and i remember there was a conversation going on in the row in front of me in this large lecture, um, and they were, and these these uh, students were originally or, or from New York or New Jersey, and they were all talking. Well, my father knows this person, and that my you know, and my uncle knows this person. I can get a job, and, and I'm thinking I don't know anybody. And uh, eventually, what I did though with the local uh, ABC affiliate is I I found an opening because they had they were going to do a, a state tell uh do a statewide telecast of the swimming and diving championships and i'm a former state swimming champion from wisconsin and i was also on the university team for a while so um they said you know this uh the anchor is a great anchor but he knows nothing about swimming so i gave him a call and i said i can help you with everything um, and i and, and instantly i became an associate producer for the, the for the telecast it opened my way in and uh, i just knew that I had to be persistent. And that's what it is. It's persistence in a dream and an idea that you follow. And, um, you know, you just don't get discouraged. It's easy to get discouraged, you know, when you see those who have um, a, a different angle or different advantage that you do, just close your eyes and go for the dream and don't let go. And that's what I did. So... And so you mentioned uh, uh, David Crockett and the, the TV series. Did you immediately start becoming a fan of history and, or did that take a while to germinate? No, you know, it was, it was, uh, it was um, pretty immediate. I remember the fact that um, what, what my parents did as soon as, uh, of course, I was already starting school. And um, we just had, and they, they, we built a nice little library of books on many subjects, but history through David Crockett allowed me to explore other characters, other events, other periods. And so I never let go. I mean, once I got onto him, I went to other places and, um, and it's just became fascinating. And then the other thing I have to say about my parents is when we, we did go out and travel briefly or take a vacation, we stopped at historic sites along the way and they encouraged reading and so forth. And I, I think that's what's missing in our culture today. We need um, the family members to not always depend on the formal school training we get, you know, in government schools or private schools. Education needs to continue. And this is why I love places like Discovery Park, because you're helping bridge um, that chasm where we're leaving off things and where people can come in science, of course, history, so many other things that you have at the park. And so we need places like Discovery Park and other places around the country where they feel the void of what's not happening in the school system. And so I was very fortunate because back then my parents both loved history. Um, they were not you know, they were not experts at it, but they knew there was always great stories and they, they encouraged us to explore 
you know, that part of life. Um, what did they do for a living? Well, my dad was in marketing and sales. My mom was, you know, she was a home homemaker. She was a, she was a housewife, you know, back in those days. And, and she had four, four boys to tend after. So um, that was a full-time, more than a full-time job. But um, my mom was a war bride from Germany. Uh, my dad met her overseas after, right after World War II. And they fell in love and he brought her over. And, and getting her perspective of life in Europe, and uh, as well as his, um, I was just um, monumental in understanding how people look at the same stories and but yet tell differently you know did that manifest itself in any of your brothers or are they all insurance agents or does anybody have similar kind of path that you've had no um fortunately we're all a little bit different but you know we're we're all we're all patriots um we're all believers in uh what the founders um started you know back 240 some years ago but um and and they're they they're pretty good about knowing the constitution but I'm I'm the real history nut of the of the four, and I'm the oldest, and so they 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 get a kick out of my adventures and where I take myself. So, but they're all great guys. Yeah, they're, they're in um, finance, marketing, uh, primarily, and uh, and sales. But they're they're great guys, and um, we we I would say it's, this is strange. We never had fights, the four of us, never. And I, I think it's mainly because my mom would never <laughs> allow it. <laughs> but we had, we grew up at a time when, you know, uh, I think um, patriotism, uh, the American flag, uh, of course, church, um, and many, many other things that seems to be missing today were part of our life. And I think uh, I wouldn't trade it for anything anymore. I mean, what I, what I lived through, I'm so grateful for. And so... Um, so you uh, you got the um, you got the call. We're going to fast forward back up to the to when we were talking about uh, uh, the History Channel and your involvement there. What, what were you doing when you got the call to start helping out working on that? Well, um, when I found out what there was going to be a new network, I was very excited because this is what's been missing. We felt uh, many of us felt for many years that we really needed a channel devoted to telling our story, our past. And um, so we were initially we were very excited because they were stressing authenticity and they're stressing accuracy and, and good storytelling. And um, they were willing to take risk on how they produced it. And so I, I happened to, um, the way I got on there, I, I was just persistent. I kept knocking on their door and said, you need me, you need me, you need me. And one of the reasons I uh, felt that way, um, I had since 1980, um, uh, besides taking photographs of reenactments and, and trying to, you know, look at how you can tell a story with the past, um, I became a, an active hi historical reenactor myself. And I loved it as much as taking the pictures. And I, was, I had another fight with myself. Do I want to be in the, in the period clothing or do I want to be in the, or do I taking pictures of it? And sometimes I would put my camera in my haversack and sneak pictures of, of these really great historian interpreters um, doing their thing. And uh, I learned so much from them. But so by the time the History Channel emerged, I was already, I had already been involved with living history for 14 years. And I, I knew where to pull people and resources um, where most producers didn't. So I had that, I had that connection. That really helped me a lot. You know what would be interesting, and maybe there, maybe this already exists. I love it when people give me suggestions of things I should do when I'm so busy I can barely keep up now. Yeah. But it would be fascinating to see a coffee table book of reenactors, just portraits of each one. Um, we'll sell that in the gift shop at Discovery Park if you'll do one. Okay, well, I'll tell you what. Um, I know there's a couple of books, but they're out of print now that started that in the 1980s. And... Um, um, in fact, my, my late wife is in it. She passed, unfortunately, two years ago. But she was a, she also started uh, in living history about the same time I did, but from a different state. And that's how we met. We met because of the fact she became an expert in the Native American culture. She was part Seneca. And um, so, um, but I had heard of her accomplishments and her, um, her expertise. And so we hired her to work on my first series, which was on the American frontier, it was called Frontier Legends of the Old Northwest. 
And she came in and, and um, we immediately connected and fell in love and, you know, we were together for 22 years. What a great story. Yeah. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. She was my business partner. Um, she became an outstanding producer, um, helping me wrangle all the resources we need because um, our documentary is a little bit different than others. I say, because the fact that uh, we were not shy about cinematically telling the story. In other words, it wasn't just flat art and, and interviews. We actually recreated very difficult scenes that predated photography and film. Um, you know, unlike the civil war, which is well documented visually, you know, uh, we decided that we have an advantage over most production companies because we were aggressive in recreating those scenes prior to that. And so when did you, when did you actually start uh, this particular production company that you're the head of now? And is that the, is that the, you, you started off with this one. It's always been. been well, I, I started it just after I got onto the, the history channel, a little funny story. I was trying to uh, use my name Foreman F O R E M A N in, in uh, to establish my, <laughs> my production company's name. And I couldn't get, I legally couldn't do it because George Foreman took all the names. <laughs> so uh, G Foreman, you know, Foreman, everything. So it, uh, we eventually just called it Native Sun, S-U-N Productions. And that's the way it's been since 1998. Yeah. Were you at all nervous about going out on your own and starting this? Or did you sort of feel like you were going to be successful right out of the shoot? Um, combination, you know, is it's always risky, but I, I don't know, like David Crockett, um, I, you know, I became a risk taker and, um, I just decided, um, I would knew it clearly what I wanted to do. And I was very confident about what I can, how I can make things happen. One of the things that really helped me, I think, um, when, um, we were producing the history channels first series, um, through A and E called you know, the American revolution. Um, I was the last producer asked or invited to be part of the team, but um, I ended up having more of my shots on the series than anybody else. And I think it's because combination, I had already been um, besides, you know, being a director, I had already been, a, you know, a, a professional photographer, but also had placed myself, you know, creatively and visually in living history ranks with, at big events. And I already had pictures of what it should look like. So um, I was thrilled and that led that success led uh, me to get my own series on the history channel. So I, one added another and another, and the ratings were really good. And what was um, the series? The it was series. A series? Yeah, it was a series I did right after the American revolution and it was on the frontier. And then they won another one. And then I was asked to also, help other productions um, from Europe that were part of history channels, like the war horse. Uh, there's a four hour series out of, out of England. And uh, I helped coordinate all the locations and all the cavalry scenes on the U S continent. So it just built up over the time. And we were, it was unusual to do um, for my little company. We're doing being, we're producing something like 13 one hour shows uh, a year. Uh, for networks so it was so this is is this around the time i'm wondering if uh the success of ken burns uh contributed to to the money people at the network seeing hey there's an opportunity here and wanting to kind of take advantage of that kind of programming did that benefit you any oh yes i, I you know ken burns laid the groundwork for many of us because of his uh especially of the civil war um and, um, uh, you know, he, he had an excellent uh, production quality. Uh, we have different philosophies on how to, you know, to capture the past, um, you know, that I do. And I just, you know, I respect him entirely for it. But um, I'm not afraid to do scenes that predate photography and film. And, and he doesn't want to recreate anything. He, he, I see. That's his thing. And I, I, I respect that. But I, I aggressively go after it. And um, one of the things that we're also excited about is that when we do re recreate scenes with famous people, um, we have been fortunate in finding those individuals that actually look just like them. And um, it's funny that you it's funny that you say that, because I want to ask you about yeah. uh, the David Crockett uh, 
content here at Discovery Park. But before yeah. we go there, it's funny. It was just funny to me that you said that because I do think it's interesting that you found somebody mm -hmm. you know, who looks like David Crockett. So anyway, um, it's for people who are listening, what what is uh, your favorite of your work that they should look up and watch to, to get to know oh, you? Oh, my, I have, I have a lot. Fortunately, I have a lot of them because I love everything that we have done. And, you know, we, it's, um, it's been a um, labor of love. Um, one of the things that I think re remains timely um, as I look at it is one of the shows we did um, it, it called uh, First Invasion, the War of 1812. And you can go on YouTube and see every every section of it. Um, I think it, the way it's been put on YouTube is in nine parts. Um, but um, anyway, uh, uh, the reason is is because um, a little funny story about that, Scott, is that um, once I started working with the History Channel uh, with my company producing shows, I kept pitching the idea of doing those, a series on the War of 1812, and they kept saying no. And so for three years in a row, I pitched it and they said, no, no, no. So on the fourth year I was pitching it, um, um, they, they, they said, you're going to pitch this thing on the War of 1812. And before you do, we're just going to say no. I said, well, why? Well, we think it's a boring war, they said. And I said, boring. <laughs> so I, helped, I bit my tongue and then all of a sudden 9-11 happened. And um, so I'll tell you the connection between the War of 1812 and 9-11. And so what they didn't know prior to me working with them and before there was a History Channel, in 1988, I wrote a script for a potential IMAX movie on the bombardment of Fort McHenry. And so when 9-11 happened, it took my breath away, not just because of the event, which was, you know, horrible, but... Uh, and, and it changed so many people's lives, but, um, but because there was a date connected to that in the past. And so um, I, I, I waited for a few months um, to let the 9-11 stuff settle down. And then I reintroduced the whole idea of the War of 1812. And here's how I did it. I said, I am going to repitch the War of 1812. And now I said it with a lot more <laughs> gusto. And I said, I am going to, and here's why. I'm going to read you a line of, uh, in the beginning of a script that I wrote that you didn't know anything about. It was going to be for IMAX. It's not a competitor, but it's for IMAX. It hadn't happened yet. I said, but here's how the opening of that script goes. It is Sunday, September 11, 1814. America is on its last legs. They paid attention. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, that's fantastic. So the the show, you know, here we was for four years in a row. They turned it down, and then within another year, we were producing this show um, on the War of eighteen twelve, and it was the first high, completely high def show for the History Channel for the net for that network. They had some shows that were part high def and part not, but it was, but we were the first full one. Plus, um, we were the first ones to do something else no one had ever done besides tell this story is that we showed the burning of the white house in full CGI animation, as well as the bombardment, the rockets coming in at Fort McHenry. So that was brand new. And so, um, but it also was the highest rated ended up being the highest rated show on the history channel at that time. And it got us our first primetime Emmy nominations. So, um, and we had a whole bunch of Tennesseans involved with us. Our, in fact, uh, Artist uh, David Wright, who did this beautiful piece on David Crockett here. Mm -hmm. um, uh, he's out of Gallatin, as I am, but uh, David uh, was my art director, and he was nominated for a primetime Emmy for his art direction on our show. And, um, and like I said, it, it just, um, and with all the things going on today about the, the flag and the national anthem, um, there's, there's so much misinformation that we have to clear up. And, you know, I'll, I'll give you one small example is that what most people don't know is that defending the ramparts of Fort McHenry and uh, Baltimore during that invasion, um, you have black soldiers in uniform. Yeah, go ahead, take a knee. Yeah. And, and, and what also is remarkable about that event, it was the, 
every branch of service was there. Of course, at that time, you know, there was no Air Force, but there was Army, Navy, Marines, militia, civilian forces. I mean, everybody was there because we're fighting the greatest military might in the world at that time. And we thought this was it. If, if Baltimore would go down, um, chances are, that, you know, we'd be flying a, a different flag. And um, so I do, I do want to return in a minute to talk to you about uh, what, um, what the impact of whatever culture we're in. Cause you know, you're like me, we've gone through multiple uh, decades now of different cultures, but first for people who aren't aware of exactly what it is you do, can you talk us through the process of producing um, a documentary like that? You know, what is your role? How involved do you get in the actual research and the writing of the script uh -huh. versus the production? So talk, talk us through a little bit of how it goes from in here to the TV yeah, as or the big most, screen. Yeah, Scott, that's the most excellent question. Um, you know, it depends on the, on the person. Of course, um, I'm not, I would say I'm not like most producers um, and because of my background, but um, in my case um, with this, I, I help write the show. Um, I also, there was actually about three writers involved, but um, it, since this was my idea and my, you know, I knew the story, I, I, I created the outline and I worked with the writer, excellent writer. And actually another, one of the producers at the History Channel also uh, made some contributions. So, um, but we had, we had some really interesting, uh, with me, I had some interesting things to contribute. Number one, um, as, a, as a historian who knows this story really, really well, we actually started filming before the script was finished. And we, and we did that confidently because we, know, we knew this story so well. And so, um, so, um, so I played a role. Um, my, my wife um, and I produced it, which meant that we not only obviously secured the funding from this network, but more important, we laid out all the logistics. You know, we, we ended up doing something kind of miraculous with this show. The entire two hour program was all the on location stuff was done in eight days. Wow. And we were in, we were in the Cleveland area. We were in um, the Toledo area at Fort Meigs. We were at Fort McHenry. Um, and then we, were, we shot a couple other little places, but we did eight, uh, eight days of on location shooting. And on the first three days, we, we uh, accumulated 26 hours of incredible footage. But, um, and that, you do that when you're really, really organized and you know the subject intimately. And, and we did. And so you see, like, you'll see something that someone's carrying or holding, or do you, do you like look at it and go, Whoa, whoa, whoa no, that's not uh, yeah. the way it would look. That's not what it would be like. Yeah. And, and, and fortunately because of the other people that are part of our team, uh, we scrutinize everything. Um, and one of the things about high definition, which we saw was that there was the resolution was better and there's more detail being scrutinized on screen. So if you made a mistake, it's like it, it was, you know, showing up. And now today with the 4K, you know, 6K resolution, I mean, it screams at you if you do something wrong, um, if people know what they're looking at. But um, so, yeah, I got involved in every, I get involved in every aspect. Um, and sometimes it's not the case, but with this subject matter, because like I said, it was near and dear to my heart and I, had immersed it with it for since I was a kid, um, I was ready to take it on. I love the fact that uh, you and I got to start off our, you know, awareness of being people with television. Mm -hmm. And then we've been present for, you know, the uh, changes that have taken place in media to the mm -hmm. point where now we're able to sit here on a computer and look at each other and then produce mm -hmm. a podcast. We can do this as long as we want. We could go on for 20 minutes or you and I could sit here and talk for three hours yeah. and put it on. And if somebody wants to listen, great. Um, how, how have, um, how has the evolution of media impacted uh, what you do? Well, quite a bit. I mean, there's more that we can do what it always comes down to regardless of what kind of technology you have. It always comes down to, are you a good storyteller or not? 
are do you give you know it, you can wow people with all sorts of special effects and sometimes you know often that will work but it won't hold their attention if the story's not good and and so i think there is a difference here is that if you can have all the wonderful toys in the business that you can you know accumulate but if you don't know how to tell a good story hold an audience and and actually you know here's the other thing scott here's our job really and there's no way in any amount of broadcast time we can tell the whole story. And so our job is to put people on a journey um, so that they do more reading and they go to places like Discovery Park and, and see more. But it's kind of like what Disney uh, series on Davy Crockett did um, back in the 1950s for me. It, it got me on a journey. And uh, I knew that's not all there was. Um, and, but it just it just whet the appetite to know more and experience more, and I think that's our job. Um, our job is not say, "Yep, yeah, that's all you need to know." Move on to something else. No, our job is to you know start the journey with people, and that's our. I think that's our real responsibility. And I love that because uh, you know what you can tell you can be a good storyteller sitting around a fire, yeah. uh, you know, just with a group of people or on a front porch. Yeah. Um, which yeah. is probably the biggest storyteller for me was my grandmother who, yeah. you know, was uneducated, lived in Haywood County, Tennessee, but could tell a great story. So, um, oh, you know, yeah. I think that's who lit the spark for me probably. Oh, good. Yeah. Um, we're going to talk about uh, Discovery Park of America and your work here. And of course, we're going to talk about David Crockett as soon as we get back from a very quick little break. West Hand Insurance Group offers the best insurance products with exceptional customer service. They specialize in business, bonds, life and health, home, auto, and ATV and boat and motorcycle coverage. With over 30 companies to choose from, they can easily find the right product for you, your business, and your family. To find a West Hand Insurance agent closest to you, call 1-800-467-5453 or visit www.westhaninsurance.com. I hope you're enjoying the Real Foot Forward podcast from Discovery Park of America. If you are, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a positive review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. This is your host, Scott Williams, and our guest today is Gary Foreman, and we're getting ready to talk about a subject that's uh, very passionate for me and a lot of our view listeners out there. Uh, which would be Discovery Park of America, uh, Gary? When did you first? Uh, when did it first enter your uh, awareness? Well, we were always connected with uh, the comings and goings in Tennessee because we had filmed here a lot, and I had heard about the comings of uh, or the gathering uh, resources um, by Mr. Kirkland. Um, I think around 2012, and that the park was well underway and being built and so forth. And um, I also had heard that, you know, it was a focus on um, the regional history, including David Crockett. And, of course, I knew, having been to Rutherford and many places and Real Foot Lake and other places around you, um, that this was a, an opportunity maybe to let them know what kind of things I had done with networks and also on displays and with other museums. So we, we got in touch with uh, all the key people and... Um, uh, by the time it opened, we had um, done a number of exhibits on David Crockett in the settlement area, um, in the Crockett Room in Liberty Hall, and in the main building, uh, we had uh, contributed a film and some exhibit material. So. so I was not around then, obviously. And so what was the procedure like? Um, and did you work very closely with Mr. Kirkland? Um, I worked with the people under him at the time who were handling the, the buildings, but, um, you know, we certainly had meetings in with him and discussing, um, how we felt they should invest their, their monies on certain things. And we also told him where we think it was not good to invest any monies on, you know, um, we want to look out for the park, um, uh, because, you know, this, you, what you're running is a very, very, you know, high profile, high invested air, um, adventure, um, so, um, but they were very excited about what the stories of David Crockett could mean to the public. And so, and they knew that we had produced um, an award-winning show called Boone and Crockett, the Hunter Heroes for the History Channel. And I was able to get um, a, the entire broadcast footage available 
to be presented in any way possible um, at the park in the room and uh, no fee, no charge to the park, but we, you know, so we, we had uh, the sections edited and so that different um, sections could be played. We also produced, I think about a four minute short film uh, uh, that summarized the life of David Crockett and especially in West Tennessee. And so, uh, and that's in the main building. There wasn't a main building. I have to, I have to check with you on where that's at, but it's still, you know, yeah, it's still in the main building. Yeah. Um, yeah. So in production, when you produce that, so uh, it's, it's, first of all, it's very, it's a fantastic uh, production, but the guy who plays David Crockett actually looks a lot like what I think in my head, David yeah. Crockett looked like. Now I did not know that before I started researching him. Um, like most people, when I uh, think of David Crockett, I thought of, uh, you know, uh, Fess Parker or, you know, yeah. um, but when I started researching it and I'd seen the film here, you mm -hmm. know, of course, many times. And then um, I started researching for the book that I worked on mm -hmm. and saw the images of David Crockett. And I was really surprised when I went back and watched the film at how closely he actually looked like what we assume, you know, in our heads, David Crockett actually looked like. How did you find that actor? Well, it's, this is kind of interesting. And, and these, this is what uh, always used to tickle us about how these people come into our life. I had known Mark Baker, the man who portrayed David Crockett, uh, for a number of years. In fact, Mark and I and David Wright, the artist I told you about, we had all worked on the movie Last of the Mohicans together. And, um, and Mark was prematurely gray, but I, he had that, that Crockett nose and he had, you know, the eyes and the chin, you know, the strong chin. I said, God, you know, and I, I, later told David who has been also good friends with Mark. And I said, I said, David, doesn't, doesn't Mark Baker look like Crockett? We can dye, get him to dye his hair. I bet he'll look just like David. Cause he also had Crockett's build. Mark is a, Mark was an athlete. And, um, but he also, Mark was responsible for training Daniel Day Lewis in the, in the role of Hawkeye, uh, training him to use a flintlock rifle and how to load it on the run and all that. And then, and Mark also ended up like me and David ended up in the movie. And so, um, that's uh, fascinating. Now is he, he's still around. Yeah. Mark yeah. lives in Franklin, Tennessee. Okay. And well, we're, been, we're actually already talking about what we're going to do for David Crockett's birthday in 2022. Mm -hmm. We'll have to get you and he to come, come yeah, and do that would be panel fun. discussions. Yeah. That, that would be terrific. Um, and so, um, we, um, uh, every, all the clothing he wore, Mark, Mark's just a couple inches taller than me, but we have the same similar build and he fit into all my clothing. I had him in at least 13 different changes of clothes. <laughs> you know, so he wasn't always wearing buckskins and he always, you know, he didn't always wear a coonskin cap. And we had an action different, like three or four different headgear. We had a different it's a frock coat, tail coats, hunting shirt. I mean, everything. And, um, and we did this on purpose. We want to get rid of, I say get rid of, we wanted to try to shift away from the stereotype of Crockett because when you get into the real man, he's, he's so much different than what we saw on Disney. Although Disney did a great job getting us started, but when you, you know, it, it's just the practicality of living on the frontier. You didn't have one set of clothes and, um, and also, you wouldn't wear a coonskin cap in the middle of uh, summer in Tennessee. So, um, and he would so, dress differently here in Tennessee than he would when he was, you know, in Washington. You know, he didn't act like he was out hunting when he was, you know, uh, in D.C. Um, so, so your interest in David Crockett uh, continued to develop, um, and so you. Uh, became somewhat of a, or maybe a complete uh, uh, Crockett expert, if there is such a thing. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I've been. Uh, in fact, I was on uh, Biography Channel on the on Davy Crockett. I had um, Paul Hutton and I, um, another really great author historian, uh, who's also written for me on uh, a number of occasions. He and I had a great majority of all the on air, you know. Um, uh, interviews of that show. And, um, so it, it was, uh, yeah, I had, I've been recognized for years as being an expert. I'm also well connected to the family, Crockett descendants. In fact, 
I think it was, yeah, 2014, I brought the Crockett family reunion to Discovery Park. Um, yeah, that's great. What a great place for it. It was, and they loved it. They loved it. Yeah. It was just phenomenal. Yeah, it was a phenomenal. Event. And then we also, um, while they were here at Discovery Park uh, in Union City, we uh, also had a side venture uh, during their three days um, in Union City. We, we took uh, a, a tour to Real Foot Lake and, and other places around the area, did a full circle and came back to Union City. And it well, was For folks who don't know, um, how many people are considered Crockett family? How many in the United States would you say are part of that um, uh, club, if you will? Uh, hundreds, hundreds, hundreds. Yeah, yeah. it's interesting, isn't yeah. it? Um, yeah. Because you have, you have, you know, one part of the family moved to Texas with his second yeah. wife. Some of the family stayed here and mm -hmm. they all had lots of kids like people did back in those days and they had yeah. lots of kids. And so... Yeah. Uh, it's really interesting that there are uh, so many people around the world who are uh, Crockett descendants. Yeah, and it's amazing how many descendants are still in the you know in the region of Tennessee, certainly in Texas. Um, you know, Elizabeth moved from uh, West Tennessee to Texas in 1854 with a couple of her kids and um, or actually adults then, but um, and so that tradition has continued in the same place where they moved to. And in fact, there's a number of um, um, uh, key uh, primary, what I call primary descendants um, that I'm very close to. And in fact, we were just on the phone the other day. I was talking to uh, Lori Matthews, who is, um, uh, she, 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 she's a fourth uh, great granddaughter of uh, Crockett's. And she was talking about your book. And we were also talking about something related between Crockett's uh, I don't know if we have time to talk about, it, but Crockett's accident on the Mississippi River on his flatboat. We absolutely have time to talk about. Well, let that. me just tell you about this because this ties in perfectly with what I think is fascinating about all, the whole West Tennessee um, mystique here. You know, um, Crockett had a, uh, you know, and you already know this, Scott, but a lot of people don't realize that um, in 1826, and it was about February or late January, he, he um, took uh, ten, about 10,000 barrel staves on two flatboats down the Obion and then onto the Mississippi. And um, uh, he didn't do his homework on who should handle the flatboats. And he trusted in a couple of men who didn't know anything about navigating on the Mississippi. So that got him in trouble. By the time they got close to Memphis, um, the boats were out of control. So he lashed them together so they wouldn't separate. But in the middle of the night, while he was sleeping in the hull of one of the flatboats, uh, they struck a sawyer. And a sawyer, of course, is a sunken, you know, a sunken tree that punched holes in both flatboats, and they started going down. Crockett was in the hull with just wearing a shirt when all that water came pouring in. And there were, the only way that he could see save in his life, there was one little tiny window, you know, that he poked his head in his shoulders, his arms through, and he yelled to his men. He says, pull me out. It's neck or nothing. I'm out of here if you don't get me out. And they actually literally ripped him out of that window frame. And he skimmed him, like he said, like a rabbit and tore off the only clothes he had on him and plunged naked and bleeding into the, the muddy waters of the Mississippi. Rescued the next day. Here's what's interesting. Uh, by the way, that, that flatboat accident was actually a gift because he, his, his example of um, tenacity and spirit got the support of Marcus Winchester, who became the mayor, first mayor of Memphis. And, and Winchester says, we need men like you. If you can handle this with this kind of spirit, can-do spirit, and survive this. He says, we need men like you in Congress. He had already known that Crockett was a legislator, state legislator. But he says, and he says, I'll tell you what, I'll financially support you to do it. Within a year, Crockett was a congressman. And I love yeah. Marcus Winchester's story too. Yeah. Uh, he yeah. has a fascinating story that I think most people don't know about. You know, right. that he was married to um, right. a woman who was uh, non-white. Right. Uh, probably Native American, uh, possibly some African American. Anyway, she was yeah. definitely not white. Absolutely. And he was somewhat ostracized of, uh, uh, because of that. Right. You know, but he went ahead. He was the mayor 
yeah. had to live outside the city limits. Anyway, I love his story and the fact that he supported Crockett, even when his father and With Jackson, the Jack yeah. they said, cut it out. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, and he did. whether he did or not, I suspect he continued. Uh, I think he did. And here's the other thing about that. Um, so that's, that's February. Um, I've isolated the dates down as best I can, but I think it's February 9 that his, he had his accident on the, or was saved. So eight, February 8 and 9 is critical right there. And then um, February 8 and 9 is when 10 years later um, he, he arrives at, the, at San Antonio at the Alamo. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah. I didn't realize but, that. But 39 years, 39 years and two months later, um, the Sultana explodes uh, just north of Memphis. And the way I understand the story from the best historians, in fact, Jerry Potter, an author, I think he was up in your region talking to uh -huh. teachers. And yeah, yep. um, he's out of Memphis. And here's what I think is interesting, Scott, is that uh, the remnants of Crockett's flatboats um, are somewhere in the soil uh, where that channel used to be. Um, you know, and now the staves went, flowed down river and were lost forever, but the flatboats are, you know, like many other, um, uh, accidents are stuck in the mud somewhere. Well, it just so happens that the Sultana exploded about five and a half miles north of Memphis when it exploded with, uh, you know, you, you know, the story with all those Yankee prisoners heading back yeah. home after the war. Yeah, But why don't you go ahead and just hit the highlights of it for people who don't know the story? Cause it is also uh, fascinating. Yeah. Well, the Sultana was a, a steamboat, side wheelers. And um, uh, it was only supposed to accommodate about 250 people, maybe 300 max. It had over 2,000 um, prisoners of war, former prisoners of war, you know, from Andersonville and other places. And they were being shipped back north. And it, a lot of scandal was involved in that. But the point was, is that... Um, they were overloaded and the boilers were, you know, beyond uh, its capacity. And sure enough, about five and a half miles up from Memphis in the middle of the night, like maybe like 2 a.m. In, in complete darkness, the entire steamboat explodes. The boilers explode. Three of the four boilers explode and hurl these hundreds of men into the air and blown to pieces and some... Anyway, it, it was considered the um, Titanic of the Mississippi. Um, because and a lot of people don't, don't know about it. I mean, it was. Yeah, they don't. It's huge and, disaster. And so what happened was that the hulk of the boat was completely on fire with many of the men who were trapped there dying on it. And that whole hulk floated backwards in the direction of where Crockett's flatboats were. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was talking just recently to uh, Jerry potter about this because i i i still because i understand these accidents over time um i said you know just, i think there's a good chance that the the remnants and remains of the sultan and the people on board are right close to crockett's flatboats remains just because of those channels went in the same direction sure and shot out uh facing memphis is it's, it's Big curve in the river, it was called Chicken Island. Still is called Chicken Island down there. And that's where Crockett's flatboats hit the Sawyer, right off Chicken Island. And this is exactly where the hulk of the Sultana went down. Um, and it's somewhere on the eastern side of the levee on the west side of the river there. And um, only a few people know where it is. And you're right. Um, this is something that more people in West Tennessee, any place in the United States should know about is Fascinating stories here along the Mississippi and West Tennessee. Absolutely. So what um, it's sort of uh, fascinating to me that uh, David Crockett uh -huh. capitalized a bit on his fame um, early on. Uh, but in a way, his fame ended up gobbling him up. And yeah. Disney came out with a, you know, entertainment version mm -hmm. of a form of David Crockett. But I think that in many ways diminished the real person and the contributions made. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Is that, is Oh yeah. That's so, you know, I think, you no, know, I think in my early years after I got over the Disney thing, I knew there's a lot more to the story. I think it was fascinating, um, fascinated by the fact that he had outlasted so 
many setbacks. Um, his tenacity, his strength, his commitment, um, you know, the can-do spirit uh, on the frontier. I mean, these people had to be as tough as nails uh, to survive. And, um, I mean, you grew up fast and you grew up, you know, rapidly. Uh, you grew up as an adult in a much earlier age than you do now. And, um, and I think life, essentially, besides all the advances we have in medicine and so forth, I think life just wore their bodies down. And, and, and you know, you're talking about life at that time operating or moving along at three and a half miles an hour. I mean, that's, that's, that was full capacity back then on a horse or walking or whatever. And we're, we just don't get that. So, and because we don't get that, we don't get what types of individual efforts it took to survive just doing regular process of life back then. We don't get it. I mean, we don't because everything had, and whether you start fires, get water, everything was individual effort. You didn't press any buttons. You know, you were the button. You did it. And, and just so, getting diseases like malaria or whatever and yeah. then recuperating to some degree, yeah. you know, they continued to drag that around with them as yeah. they continued. You know, you look at, I love, uh, you know, Andrew Jackson getting in all those duels and getting shot and carrying those bullet fragments Bulletin, yeah, inside of them, know, yeah. around with them. Yeah. And, you know, when you, when you, when you read the list of things he was physically trying to live with, it's mm -hmm. fascinating that they continued trying to run the country you know, yeah. whereas we would check ourselves into the minor med, you yeah. know, and yeah. then, you know, these, these folks just kept pushing, kept pushing. Absolutely. And I, you know, and what you just said there, Scott, is one of the reasons that it kept me uh, anchored to the Crockett story, because I, it, the more and more I, I delved into it, uh, I, I just couldn't believe why this man was still alive by the time he got to Congress. In fact, as you probably already know, I'm, I know you know this, um, his, his first days in in Washington as a congressman, he wasn't in the halls of Congress. He was in, in a bed recuperating from another bout of malaria. And mm -hmm. they took two quarts. He said two quarts of blood out of him. He said, which took away my red rosy cheeks um, that I carried all my ears. I and mean, we got his cheek. He got the rosy cheeks back. But boy, uh, he had ongoing uh, recurrences of malaria for 16 years. No, I'm sorry, 19 years. Yeah. Uh, even on his trip to Texas, uh, it often is stated that he was ill off and on on that trip. And um, so he was, yeah, he was, he was worn thin by the time he faced his demise at the Alamo. Yeah. Well, and I love, I love uh, reading about Andrew Jackson and David Crockett and the Tennessee, all the Junto, you know, um, mm -hmm. when you look at w the culture that you and I are living in today, that is certainly very divided. Yes. Uh, you know, we're in an era that is probably uh, significant for those in the future that will be looking back at the time yeah. we're in, you know, and so it was interesting to me to look at um, Crockett and Jackson and, and Polk and you know, yeah. fighting and looking at, I love media. And so looking at the things that were, that everybody wrote about everybody else, mm -hmm. you know, what do you think we can take away today uh, from your, all your looking back at history, what, what do you think we as consumers of media, as people who need to be engaged in politics, what do you think we can take away looking at Crockett and his peers back then? Well, first of all, um, good question. I, I would say, first of all, do not rely on one source. Um, always, always do your, you know, uh, don't go for sound bites. Go, you know, something that may sound cute at the time. Do not believe in them and do your own homework. And, that, and see, one of the things that they used to do back then was that politics was their entertainment. In other words, when they got news, you know, they would have debates in the towns. Even, even you know, de, de Tocqueville talked about this um, in his book, uh, Democracy in America, um, how fascinating these people were in the fact that they understood more than we do today, that, you know, they were, we, the people, they, they were the, the Kings, they were the sovereigns, not, not the people in Washington. And they believed in the fact that, you know, it was their responsibility to be up on all um, the topics as much as possible. And they, you know, and they didn't have new sources like we do. 
Although sometimes I wouldn't know if we call them news sources. <laughs> um, so I, I think that's the big difference there in the people is that um, debates were big deals. Um, more important than, you know, we would look, you know, uh, today we would look at football games and, you know, college rivalries. No, they couldn't wait to get into the town center and debate things all the time. Uh, that was their that was their sport, and that's what caught the attention of people like De Tocqueville and many other socialites who were coming in from Europe. They were saying there's something special going on in this country right now that we do not have back in in the old country, and they felt that this was unique. You know, to see the populace, the Americans. Um, direct the, you know, through the constitution, um, through what the founding fathers started, direct the course of their destiny. And um, that's what Crockett was part of. And, um, you know, there's always, there's always culprits throughout all time that decide that, you know, I'm, I'm going to be the elitist here and I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to change the rules, but that's not um, uh, in the 1830s. It was in twenties and thirties and thirties, especially was such an era of expansionism and, and everybody was excited about it. There was an electricity in the air. You know, Emerson wrote um, a couple of things. He said, um, Europe stretches to the Alleghenies, America lies beyond. But he also said the Americans to hitch a wagon to the star, you know, don't limit yourself. The possibilities are endless. And so Crockett was caught up in that spirit. Um, you know, he had, as you know, he grew up in grinding poverty and uh, it was it was horrible conditions and what he was used to. And he now was flirting with or hanging out with some of the, the, the most powerful people on the American continent uh, when he was in Washington. And, you know, he had to pinch himself, I'm sure. You know, uh, I think his demise um, is part of a very interesting paradox of, of both ambition and, and ego. Um, you know, I, I think um, if, you know, he, would he come back today? He, I think he would spell out very clearly because he was pretty honest. Um, and in fact, he was so honest in his narrative. He talked about his downfalls and his weaknesses and so forth. But he, he I think he realized there were political machines back then as we have today. And that he was trying to figgle and finagle his way through the machinery process. And then sometimes that meant telling big stories and sometimes that meant doing other things that was not really his character. You know, there was one time he was, um, he had guests into his boarding house, his boarding place where uh, Mrs. Ball's boarding house in, on 6th Avenue, I think it was, uh, in Washington. And, um, and a bunch of people had come up to see him. So he threw on a hunting shirt and through his, you know, and he kind of didn't sit up straight, just kind of slouched around like he was a good old boy. And he put on a show and told them some stories and they got up and left. And he says, well, he says, I hope they enjoyed the show. Didn't cost them much. <laughs> so he, basically he was trying to live up to this, this mystique of this half horse, half alligator creature that people had made of him. But um, he was, he was combination of, I think Scott, maybe you found this too. I think he was a little enamored with it, but he was also a little bit uh, irritated by it at the same time because it limited him in his credibility. Um, I mean, I think anybody who has done something and stood on a stage and received applause or gratitude uh -huh. knows the buzz that can be. And I think he experienced that and he liked that. Yeah. Uh, but I do think he, and I think he was using that, um, to further his career. But mm -hmm. I think at the same time, from what I was able to pick up, mm -hmm. I think there was truly a passion for the people of Tennessee and the squatters. And he was oh, really, yeah. really did want to also, he wanted to both receive the pleasure of that, but I do think he also wanted to capitalize on that. Um, well, yeah. And, you know, in fact, you know, he knew that other people were capitalizing on his legend, you know, the, the um, sketches and eccentricities of Colonel David Crockett, you know, was written and I think it came out in 1833 well, Crockett, you know, um, you know, uh, at that time, 1833, he was just, uh, he had been out of Washington for two years because he had lost that election in 1831. And then he wanted to come back in 33. And when he did, he wanted to make up for some lost time because other people were making money off of his own story. 
and he wanted to set the matter straight, which he wrote his own book right after that and got back. But, um, you know, I, I think that uh, the machinery uh, that he was up against through Jackson and Polk and others were so, were so powerful that they were actually shocked that he came back and defeated their own people. But they were also shocked and concerned that Crockett's popularity had gone way beyond anything anybody estimated. For instance, as you know, he got back, um, he, when he got back in 1833 to Washington City at the time, he, one of the first things he did, he went to the play to see the Lion of the West, you know, in, in December, right around Christmas time. And um, uh, he was so, so caught up with the, the amazement that his, his legendary stature and his language and everything was being copied. Now he was a, this, you know, this, he was a rock star, you know, and um, that had to play of some interesting things on his mind. Here you go. You know, old, good old boy from, you know, that grew up in grinding poverty. And now look at me, I'm, they're even imitating me on stage. And, I, and I had never been to a theater before, you know, and here I am seeing myself and, and the crowd, you know, when James Hackett, the guy portraying Colonel Nimrod Wildfire was, which was a parody on David Crockett, Hackett knew it. Hackett was kind of like the John Wayne of his time. Okay. Um, or any other actor, but you know, very famous. And it was amazing when the curtains pulled back and Hackett knew that Crockett was out in the audience and knew it was the first time Crockett had ever seen his play. And Hackett, you know, garishly, you know, you know, equipped or adorned with, you know, buckskins and furs and everything else. Crockett is in gentleman's clothes and Hackett points out Crockett, bows to him. Crockett stands up and ba bows back and you got legend meaning legend. And the crowd went nuts and Crockett's head must have been spinning like, oh my God, I can't believe this. You know, <laughs> I can't. I, he must have been feeling like he was gone to heaven because um, it was just like, how can this really, really be? But well, he became um, he became an influencer, yeah. you know, much as today's, you know, folks can uh, start off in politics and grow and grow and grow until their their brand mm -hmm. exceeds them as a human being. Yeah. And then they have to figure out how to manage that. Um, and he was in a lot of ways, same kind of thing. Um I can't help because of my background, compare him a little bit to Elvis Presley, you know, mm -hmm. and somebody who starts off a, a, a nobody and, you know, their image yeah. grows and grows and grows in today. So I'm, I'm curious what another part of the Crockett uh, mm -hmm. legacy that's interesting to me is um, East Tennessee, Middle Tennessee, West Tennessee, and Texas. Mm -hmm. uh, Crockett is as celebrated, I have found, in Texas as he is in all of Tennessee. Mm -hmm. uh, have you found the same, the same thing in your uh, history research? Absolutely. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, part of it, you know, was his, um, his martyrdom at the Alamo, but you know, he, um, when he left Memphis around November 8th, I think it was 1835. Um, and you know, he told his, he, he told the old story over and over. He says, um, um, I've told my constituents, if you want to select a timber toe to, uh, to succeed me, y'all can go to hell and I'm going to Texas. Well, he kept telling that and he, people just loved it. Whether he told it in Little Rock, Arkansas, or it doesn't matter all the way through. Which is very but, funny because I was curious if I could find where he said it the first time and I could never find where he actually said it. All I could find is places where he said he said it. You know, So mm -hmm. he, he repeated it multiple, multiple times. Yeah, I think he... Um, I think when he made up his mind um, after talking to the family, I, I think it, this would start uh, to go collect around barbecues, which was very common back then, and um, and gatherings. And, and when he had his last one, was actually on Hall what we know as Halloween, uh, October 31. And he, I know he said it there. Uh, and then he wrote his last letter from Tennessee um, to his family, uh, the Pattons, um, from there. And, um, I have a, I have a photographic copy of the original letter. Um, the original letter is owned by Hollywood producer, director, David Zucker. Who's a huge, uh, David Crockett fan. Yeah, he was at one time going to, 
he was going to produce a uh, an actual movie. I don't know where that stands, but uh, I don't think he's. I don't think. I think he's. David is in his mid seventies now, and I think that has gone downstream from him. Um, however, um, you know, I think the best story of David Crockett and the best story of the Alamo is yet to be written, as far as a, as a motion picture. Yeah. And I, you know, and it goes back to this too, which you're, I think you're referring to here is I think Crockett is more relevant to us now than ever, you know, as, as we move down our own journey path in this country about politics and everything else, um, Crockett's character becomes more relevant if we are able to tell it correctly. Um, and the things that you bring up in your book, you know, the, the celebrity status and all that people get that because they understand that the, what the fickle nature of media and of the public is all about. Um, but also um, the, the fleeting, you know, f- you know uh, the fleeting fame that we know uh, is, is so common. We see it in Hollywood, we see it in everything. And, um, and it was also the same thing with Crockett in Washington. But, um, but this also leads to me to some other, <laughs> I mean, Scott, you, I, I know you, in, in, in doing your book, you came across I'm sure some really funny episodes uh, with Croc, the little tricks or little things he said. It's just. No, he um, was absolutely very, very funny and, and uh, knew how to work a room, you know, knew how to, uh, you know, he was a comedian. Well, you know what? I think here's what I think. I think he was. And, and I think our audience will understand it. He was in many respects, the Robin Williams of his time. Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, he could impersonate people. And, you know, and, and that's what um, the audience, the galleries around in, in Washington, in Congress Hall, uh, whenever he got up, he would imitate someone or make someone make fun of someone. And so he would, he would just even, you know, even their dialect or anything. And um, he was good at that. And he did, you know, this started off when he was in the legislature when that, um, I forget who it was, made, uh, I think it was Mitchell, made fun of him um, as, as a gentleman from the cane. And, you know, Crockett took that ruffle and pinned it on his rough shirt. And, and but he, I, I think the, the genesis of his comedy and storytelling came from the time when he was young and ran away from home and had to survive, as they say, with uh, quick wits and fast feet. And, um, <laughs> But, well, it you was know, Zucker who called him uh, the first uh, uh, Groucho Marx. Yeah, he, he but, but he, he and you know, and Harper's Weekly um, often said, "Look, if if you're in Washington City and you have not seen Colonel Crockett, um, you know, and you know, give his press or you know, oratories," I said, "You have robbed yourself of a phenomenal opportunity." And this was from this is an uneducated frontiersman who's you know in in Tennessee and yeah really just going by his gut yeah exactly exactly really fascinating so you and i could talk about this forever and we're gonna have to get you over here to do so yeah. um tell me a little bit about what you have coming up next well um i am i'm working on um several things i've as i i, I told you I'm, I'm actually working on with my this new camera system i'm and others that i've had for years i'm developing a coffee table book approach uh, to telling the story of david crockett a lot of scenes shot on location um, throughout Tennessee, Texas, and other places. I've been, I even been to the swamps of Florida where he was. Um, I've, you know, I've been to, uh, of course, Washington, Philadelphia. Um, I found places with that, you know, that very few people knew that he was there. Um, and it's just it, it, trying to culminate the feeling of, um, you know, of course, I'm writing on the coattails of all you great other authors that have done such great works on Croc and many others. But th- this one's going to be a little bit different. Um, I think um, I'm going to incorporate some technology, in other words, um, QR codes, so um, you can have your handheld device and have a video presentation that augments what you see in the book. It's awesome. So uh, and so, I need. To- I want to talk to you about that as well. And uh, well, I know uh, a good place for you to do a, a big uh, premiere party when your book is published. Oh yeah, it would be. Party. You know, it would be great. Um, you know, I, I, I love. You know, what a backdrop uh, Discovery Park is for all of that. You know, and um, so 
um, but where I'm going with this, I mean, some of the funniest things that, uh, and when I tell people who don't know much about David Crockett about some of the things he said or would do, one I I don't know I don't know if you came across this one, I, and I'm trying to remember the the senator from New England. Uh, they're coming out of Congress a session, and they're all in in Washington. And they're coming down the steps of the Capitol. And those days, you know, Washington was very rural. It had a lot of farm animals and flocks and things coming through. And um, <laughs> and um, so there's one big herd of farm animals coming through and they had to wait. And the Senator says, uh, Colonel, he says, I see a lot of your constituents in our in town. What are they up to? He, without skipping a beat, <laughs> Crockett turns around and says, well, they're going to New England to teach school. <laughs> 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 so, I mean, it was, a, but some of the things he did in West Tennessee and the, and the, you know, the stump speeches and oh my God, one I can think of, I, I don't know if you've heard about this one, when he was, um, um, he, he found out that, you know, that his opponent, um, I think this was in 1830, 1833, um, his opponent was um, coming to listen to Crockett speak and, and Crockett decided, I'll, I'll go first. And this guy, great, I'll, I'll kill him because Crock is, you know, telling lies. But they're both lying about each other um, at that time. And Crockett was there to confess uh, right off the bat that they both had been telling lies. However, when it comes to doing anything, you know, leaping the Ohio and wading the Mississippi and ride a streak of lightning uh, or even lying, I could do it better than anybody. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the other guy just walked away just you know i also like the like and i can't remember who it is it might have been butler when they yeah. would go out and and go together yeah. and they had an order they would go in and and butler would go first and then the other guy and then crockett would be the last one yeah and so finally he says one time you know he'd heard their same speeches over and over and over again yeah and then he says can i go for, i'd like to go first this time i let him go oh, yeah. first. And he gave his speech you know, yeah, the whole thing. Yeah, you so, memorize. So <laughs> that's what I'm saying. And he, I'm sure he acted like him. He imitated right. the whole. The yeah, he memorized the speech. I mean, you talk about a very quick mind, um, always thinking, always leveraging. Things. And imagine somebody giving your speech right before you go up. You know, <laughs> I, I would love to have seen and, him and acting like, and acting like you. You know, <laughs> he would he would even study the way you know, their physical, if they had a limp or if they, you know, favored one side or not in a certain way, he would do that. And it would drive everybody in the audience nuts because they're saying, look, I look what he's doing to these people. Uh, he was, yeah, he was Robin Williams of the 1830s. Yeah. And they were not used to that Washington elite. Were, yeah. They were not used to that behavior. You yeah. know, they were not used to <laughs> Anyway, um, I, I um, I'm so glad that you're doing uh, a project to let more people know um, about Crockett. And, you know, I think, you know, through this, I've met a few people like us who are interested in this topic. So the more we can get the word out, I think the better. Well, you've got some other um, interesting people. You know, you talk about the Alamo. Here's what I find fascinating. Um, in Dyersburg, as I think you and I discussed before, um, the McCullough family. Um, was going to, to move to Texas with the Crockett's and settle there along the Red River and started their whole com own community. And uh, Ben McCullough um, was ill um, when David and his party left, and they were supposed to all join together, but he was ill, and he said, well, I'll meet you in Nacogdoches. Well, they missed, and the, that, that mistiming on, on McCullough saved his life because McCullough ended up at the Battle of San Jacinto um, commanding one of the artillery pieces. And, um, and he later became, here's what's interesting about McCullough. He became, he became, uh, he became a Texas Ranger, noted Texas Rangers, even a statue on state capitol grounds in Austin of McCullough, of Dyersburg. And his brother Henry was also a Texas Ranger. And he also became a U.S. Marshal and later became a Confederate general, and he was mortally wounded on the same day he would have died with David Crockett, only 26 wow. years later. Yeah. 
fascinating, isn't it? Yeah. So many stories like that. Yeah. In West so, Tennessee. And, and then you had, of course, the Dickinsons um, out of, um, uh, I think, the Jackson area over there. Um, and they were, when they were in, ten, uh, in Texas, they obviously knew who Crockett was because they were part of his ninth congressional district. So they had seen his speeches and so forth. So it was kind of like almost like a little Tennessee reunion there inside the walls of the Alamo, you know. And, and she, she was eyewitness um, when she walked out of the Alamo church where she had taken refuge. After the battle, she walked out and then she reported that she had seen Colonel Crockett lying dead and mutilated between the church and the two-story barrack building as she walked past. He would have been off to her, her right as uh, she walked out. Uh, so um, I, I uh, want to touch on that as our last uh, thing we talk about uh, today is sort of the, I don't want to use the word controversy, I guess it is controversial, uh -huh. um, is, you know, how did David Crockett die at the Alamo? And, mm -hmm. you know, there's the recent book that came out and a lot of controversy around that. What are your thoughts on uh, how David Crockett died at the Alamo? Well, you know, f for me, it's really easy. And because um, when I say it's easy, um, I have been a student of the Battle of the Alamo for many, many, many years. And the people who argue the most about him dying, going down fighting, truly have not understood the flow of battle that allowed Crockett and others to fall back into positions. Um, and I, I say he didn't surrender. He outlasted the battle along with five others. I mean, the battle was over. And then, the, in fact, the, one, of the Mexican, the, the, one of the primary uh, witnesses said that they had outlasted the battle. They had survived the carnage. They didn't say they gave up. They said the battle was over, and they still find these six men still alive, out of ammunition, bloodied up. And still in a refuge area, you know, between these three, you know, three foot you know, wide stone walls. And um, it was a, it was an off a general Castrion that said the battle's over. You know, you are under my protection. I promise you, you know, clemency. And of course, so, so they come out because everyone's dead or the battle's over. And one of the reasons the battle was over, the Mexicans had to stop firing because they're killing their own at this time. In the crossfire, in the smoke, in the darkness, they were taking, you know, friendly fire. And so they blew the bugles, and now they find six people, Texans, who are still alive. And plenty of eyewitnesses saying it was David Crockett. Here's what I find really interesting about this whole deal, because um, it's more fascinating to me than if, the way the other versions of him, you know, swinging a rifle and all that. I'm not saying he wasn't in hand-to-hand -hand combat. More than likely, he was. He just was able. I mean, he's a frontiersman for goodness sakes. You know, he was he was strong man, but he was he was not a kamikaze pilot. He you know he was, and and um, but he he and others fell back to what they think was their last position before they all go, and the battle's over. So when he comes out. In promises, you know, this protection under this general, Santa Ana rides in with his escorts. And Santa Ana is furious that this general, this great general, Castrion, um, gives them protection. And they get into a big fight right there in front of the Alamo Church today. This way I, I, I see it happening. And, and as well as described by other Mexican soldiers and officers. And a argument blows up between the two. And so Crockett and the others know this isn't going well <laughs> on our behalf. And all of a sudden, Santa Ana gives an order to his elite troops who are standing right there. He said, kill them. They don't. The order is not being followed up. And you can almost like hear a pin drop. And then there's stirring in the background. Who are what's the stirring? It's the escort officers who did not, not fight in the battle. Their uniforms are completely clean, and they pull out their swords and to impress their general Isimo, they leap upon him and slash him down in pieces. And what's real interesting, two things happen. Number one, not one insult about the way these men took death, staring it in the eye. Now you gotta imagine. 
they had been under siege for two weeks. They hardly slept. They had terrible food and water conditions. You know, they probably had 15 minutes of adrenaline in their bodies anyway. That's it. They were worn out. So the way they stared at those coming at them to cut them down did two things. Number one, it, it gave, it, it, it raised their credibility and admiration by these other officers. They didn't ever insult them. These, they said these men took it. The other thing it did, it started dividing the high command against Santa Ana. General Castrillon never spoke to Santa Ana after that. And Castrillon was considered the most respected general of the entire Mexican army. And so I see that the esprit de corps of that formidable Mexican army has fallen apart. And it did fall apart. And it was no secret. And I think the way Crockett went down, and, and it's understood by several others, that there was an effort on his part to go after Santa Ana at the last minute, and he was cut down. Um, here's the other thing. Kind of, this one's kind of spooky, I think. Two years prior to his death, there is one other man in Washington who is an um, ambassador on behalf of Mexico. And his name is um, General, um, General Colonel Juan Almonte. And Juan Almonte was hanging out at the same place as Crockett was hanging out and was probably spying on listening to the Southern legislators talking about Mexico and everything else. He even wrote letters um, bringing Crockett into the discussion. He's at the Alamo. Wow. He's at the Alamo. Yeah. He knows David Crockett. Whether Crockett and he, his eyes gas, I'm not sure. We don't know that. However, however, Juan Almonte never insulted Crockett uh, from that point on. And when he was captured at San Jacinto, okay, he mentioned to the, uh, into the interrogator that he, he, that Crockett was one of those who had outlasted the battle and was brutally executed. Yeah, that's fascinating. And then and, and he saw him two years before that. Yeah, yeah. In Washington. Yeah. yeah, so he knew who he was looking at. You know, now that's my that's how I put it together. Yeah. You know, now, and, one and, thing that's indisputable, uh, mm -hmm. where he died, how he died, contributed to, you know, what would eventually become the outsized uh, brand of mm -hmm. David Crockett that continued to grow and grow and grow and grow yeah. um, until we got to the 50s. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, but here's the inter interesting thing about this. Um, even in the early books that my parents brought into our little library, it all stated that he outlasted the battle and he was and, and Santa ordered their execution. No one had a problem with it until Fess Parker starts swinging that rifle in the last <laughs> episode. And so, I mean, even uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt wrote a book on, on Crockett and other Western heroes and shows him in an illustration being executed. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. I've seen that. And so no one ever, no one had any problem until our pop culture uh, put right. it on the screen. Yeah, yeah. Today's popular culture versus the popular yeah. culture from Crockett's day. Exactly. You know, the whole thing is fascinating. Yeah. Um, and we could talk forever. If if somebody's interested in when your book is out, you know, yeah. and when you know, how do they uh, how do they track you? Where should we follow you at? Well, I'll tell you what. I'm. I'm we'll have. I'll provide a. a some websites here for you, uh, nativesunproductions.com. Okay. Uh, but here's the other one. Um, I What we'll do is uh, we'll release it and uh, set up something through Discovery Park. That'd be fantastic. We, that's, how, that's how we'll let the world know how we did it. I, I can't think of a be, better place to do it. We will be happy to uh, participate in any way we can to get the word out. So yeah. thank you so much for taking your time. I know you're a busy guy and you got a lot going on. So thank you. Well, We'll, we'll tell you more about it a little bit later, but thanks so much for having me on. Great to be with all your folks as well. Look forward to seeing you in Union City. And thank you to all you listeners who joined today at Discovery Park of America. Our mission here is to inspire children and adults to see beyond. To plan an experience here for you and your family, visit discoveryparkofamerica.com.